I am the Homeless Education Program Coordinator for Omaha Public Schools, and I am going to talk to you about the Homeless Education Program at OPS, and I'm going to talk to you about the McKinney-Vento Homeless Education Law and how the programs actually work in public schools, and then we'll talk about some other areas of homelessness that students and families face. Please, 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 if you have questions at any point, ask, because otherwise you're just going to hear me talk, and I don't want to hear myself talk any more than you probably do. So just keep that in mind. I always like to put this slide up first because it's something that, if you look at it, there is no real answer. How many of these students are actually homeless? Well, you don't know. And so those of you that are educators or those of you that are parents or those of you, and I know a lot of you work with the public schools, it's important to realize that students that are in public schools don't wear a sign around their neck that necessarily says, we'll work for food or we'll get an education for food. I'm a homeless student. So you have to be aware of this and the districts themselves have to be aware of this. That's why they have someone like myself in place so that we can address the needs of those students. And the other thing I want to mention before we get really into this information is that when you think of a student or a family and when both home and school disappear simultaneously, and what I mean by that is maybe you lose your home and so you have to move and so you may have to go to a different school or a school district, Children especially are unanchored. Yeah, adults can handle it and it's a stressful thing, but you have to remember for a child to bounce around like that, it's difficult. They lose friends, they have to make new ones. They lose them again. They have to get used to new schools, new teachers, new schoolwork, and oftentimes it's sort of a discontinuous with what they were doing previously, so it doesn't always match up. Even if you just bounce from one school to another within your district, like at OPS, you still kind of lose a little bit of that. They also have to confront that stigmatism, the insensitivity, the rejection by classmates and teachers, which unfortunately does happen. And I kind of want to read something. This is from a 12-year-old student who happened to be uh, uh, in a homeless program. People in school call me a hotel kid. They have no right to punish me for something I have no control over. I'm just a little boy living in a hotel, petrified, wanting to know what's going to happen to me. I'm not a hotel kid. I'm a child who lives in a hotel. So it's real important to remember that these are not homeless students as much as they are students who happen to be homeless. So let's talk about the program. Some basic numbers, and I know you all can read them, but I'll just share this with you. 40% of all homeless children are under the age of five. And this is the one that always gets me, and there's a commercial running now actually on, I think it's a, uh, if it's a state farm or an all-state commercial uh, where they talk about uh, homelessness a little bit. And the average person experiencing homelessness is nine year old. So the average third grader in Nebraska is nine. So the average homeless person in the United States is nine. So the average homeless person in the United States is a third grader. It's not an adult. It's not a mom or a dad. It, it, it's just a child. Families are the fastest growing segment of the homeless population. More than three and a half million people are homeless every night. One and a third a million of those are children. That's a large number. This is the United States. We have a million and a third children that are homeless. Approximately 20,000 people are homeless in Nebraska every night. And this is a public school figure. Keep in mind public school. In 2015-16, Nebraska public schools reported 3,530 students as homeless. And this was under the McKinney-Vento law or the act and 453 of which were unaccompanied youth. We'll talk about that in a second. That number to me is woefully low. We have 250 some odd school districts in the state and we only reported 3,500 students as homeless. Woefully low to me and, and OPS where I work, we, we probably don't do a great number or a great job of of making sure we help all the students. Right now, as of this morning when I left, we had 803 students enrolled in our program that are homeless this school year. Now, our enrollment at OPS is 52,000 plus. There's a statistic that says any public school system or public school, 1% of their population, student population, is homeless at any given time. So we have 800 and some students homeless, so we're above that national average. To me, that's woefully low. Again, keeping in mind, average age of a homeless person in the United States is nine years old. 
What is McKinney-Vento? Well, McKinney-Vento, the Homeless Education Act, real briefly, not a lot of history, not big on this, but two senators, Stuart McKinney and Bruce Vento, 1987, got together, and along with No Child Left Behind under the Reagan era, they came up with uh, the needs, and then they came up with an actual law they implemented which was for students that were in displaced situations or what they labeled as homeless, and we'll talk about that definition because there is a very specific definition for public schools in McKinney-Vento. It was reauthorized again in 2002 under No Child Left Behind and, and with the Obama era, and now Every Student Succeeds Act, ESA, also has the homeless uh, McKinney-Vento portion, and they've added things to it, and they've changed a few things. It's actually gonna be better and, and even more restrictive the basic themes of McKinney-Vento are homelessness with public schools or school stability, school access, child-centered case-by-case decision-making, immediate free lunch, and unaccompanied youth identification. There's that term again. We'll I'll kind of explain that here in a second. But those were the pieces that McKinney and Vento decided we needed to address. So the eligibility. Who is a homeless student? What does homelessness mean under McKinney-Vento? The definition is, just as it reads, it's children lacking a fixed, regular, adequate nighttime residence. So it's very broad, but when it comes down to it, when we look at is this student homeless or are they not, we just simply have to ask, do they have a fixed, regular, adequate nighttime residence? If they don't, we get them enrolled in the program. If they do, then, then obviously we're not going to enroll them. So we'll talk a little bit about that. What does it really mean? Well, it could be sharing others' housing due to a loss of housing, economic hardship, fire, infestation. So for example, if a family lived in a home and they lost their home due to a fire, and they moved into a hotel or moved in with another family or something of that nature, they would qualify as homeless under the law. And so the law would pertain to those particular children if they were going to public school. Living in hotels, motels, campgrounds due to a lack of alternative accommodations, Living in emergency shelters, transitional shelters, or agencies, that can be everything from the traditional homeless shelter to uh, recovery programs to domestic violence shelters, uh, single parent uh, programs, hospitals and treatment facilities, particularly Omaha, we have like UNMC, Boys Town, Oxford Houses. Uh, we have families that moved to Omaha to get treatment at the Lead Transplant Center. And as a result, they have to go to public school. Their children go to public school because it's such a temporary thing, whether they're living at the Ronald McDonald House or whether they're living in a hotel and the other child or one of the children attending school is receiving treatment. Obviously, they're going to fall into this category because it isn't a permanent address. Some of that stuff sounds, you know, like the Lee Transplant Center. It's an unfortunate situation, but it still qualifies as homelessness. Uh, being doubled up, one of those situations where you move in with another family for whatever the reason. Uh, again, it doesn't sound like a horrible situation, but they do qualify. When you think of homelessness, most of the time you think of a traditional situation where they might be living in a homeless shelter, or they might be living in their car, or something of that nature. Now, we serve a lot of agencies in Omaha, and we serve a lot of shelters in the Omaha metropolitan area. And it's not just the Omaha area. We serve shelters in Bellevue. We serve shelters, actually, um, outside of uh, Omaha as far as Ralston and those types of areas. So any one of our students that ends up in one of those facilities will still be uh, enrolled and taken back to OPS, and we'll kind of talk about that. That unaccompanied youth term, what is an unaccompanied youth? An unaccompanied youth is a couch surfer. It's that high school student that bounces around. Actually, it's a student that doesn't have any parental guardianship or any, any, any parenting, and most times a high school student. You're not going to see that happen with a child. Seldom. But you'll get a high school student that bounces around from place to place for whatever reason. They left home because they got kicked out, left home because they don't want to be there, whatever the case may be. So they're living with grandma for a day, then they live with a friend for a day. That's the population that OPS in particular and the state neglects or is, is, is not doing a good job of, of finding and serving. Those students are great at flying under the radar. They're survivors in a lot of cases. It is a federal term and we do, all public schools have to turn in data at the end of the year to, to, um, to the government regarding how many uh, unaccompanied youth you had. It is a number that, that we're real low in. Also serving preschool and Head Start considerations. OPS serves pre-K through 12th grade. If you're in Head Start, 
if, for example, if we have a family lives in a shelter and you have four children and two go to high school, one goes to elementary school, one of them maybe is in Head Start or Pre-K, we certainly enroll the student in the program. We try to help. Transportation is always an issue, but that, that, is, that is something we will do. Special education students, when you have IDEA or McKinney-Vento, uh, in essence, we want to make sure we have the student in the program. They're eligible, but if they have special education needs that trump McKinney-Vento services, we're obviously going to go with special education needs, particularly transportation, which is always the biggest issue. As mentioned, those living in cars, parks, abandoned buildings, bus stations, tent cities, those types of things, all eligible. And then migrant education, which is a growing population across the state, particularly in Omaha. We have a migrant education program along with our ESL and ELL programs. And those students are certainly eligible. Interesting thing about those folks is a lot of times they may have three or four families living in one dwelling, may not necessarily be aware of the program, and or because of some language barriers or a lack of understanding of what's available in the public school, they don't always get served either. So it, it, it's, uh, it's one of those things that you have to be vigilant in finding those students and or making sure your district staff are aware of what McKinney-Vento does and what it does to serve students so that we can help those students. Foster care. Having been a caseworker a billion years ago, I happen to believe that foster care is anything but a permanent housing situation. Uh, knowing that I've had, you know, had had to remove children from homes for whatever reason that were in foster care, just didn't work out, put them in another situation. So is it a, is it a, is it a fixed, adequate, permanent nighttime residence? Well, technically, yes, but probably not fixed. So foster care, however, is not covered under McKinney-Vento. It used to be covered. Two states had previously covered it. Nebraska wasn't one of them. And it used to be covered under McKinney-Vento as if it was 30-day or less emergency placement placed in foster care, removed last night, put in this situation, we're going to get them out of there in 30 days. We'd cover those students. And I'll talk about what, what I mean by covering it here in a second. But now, under ESSA, it's now covered, covered under the Foster Care Education Act. So anything to do with foster care students is no longer under McKinney-Vento. Now, I still get a lot of calls from foster families needing assistance, and we still help them. It's just not covered under McKinney-Vento. They are still eligible for some of the same things, for example, being able to stay in their school of origin with or without transportation provided by the district. Unaccompanied youth talked a little bit about who they were. It is a federal term for reporting. Now, what does McKinney-Vento do? What are the requirements? Well, here there's four pillars to it. Think of a table with four legs. One of them is, and again, this goes back to Stuart McKinney and Bruce Vento coming up with, well, what are we going to do for these students that are displaced, these students that bounce around, these students that are in these shelters? Well, we need to maintain enrollment of school of origin. So, for example, if you become homeless and you're attending a school and you live within a walking distance, and in Omaha in particular, if you move to a shelter that's quite a ways away, would no longer be in your attendance area. That student can stay at that school of origin, and we as a district have to make sure not only that we keep them there, but that we get them there at the parent's request. We don't do a great job of that. We need to improve upon that. It's something we have to work on all the time. But you do have the right to stay at your school of origin. And they can stay there for the rest of the school year, no matter how many times they move or where they move, as long as it's within the district or within a reasonable amount. If they're in uh, OPS and they move to Millard, if you're familiar with the Omaha metropolitan area, or you move to Ralston or Bellevue, you can still stay at OPS. However, if you move to Waverly, we're not going to transport you back to Omaha Public Schools. It's just not a, it's not a feasible thing to do. So you can stay at your school of origin. School selection. So if you move to Omaha or Lincoln and you're from out of state and you move into a homeless situation, move into a shelter, we're, we're traveling, we've left one place, we're in a domestic violence situation, we're fleeing and we're coming to Omaha, we're in one of our domestic violence shelters and we want to enroll at this school. Well, we don't have your immunizations. We don't have any of your paperwork. Doesn't matter. Paperwork follows the child in a homeless situation. We have to get those students enrolled immediately. Now, if they're high school students and there's some academic concerns, or if they have an IEP that's pending and we don't know, then we delay the process because you've got to make sure that we put them in the right classes. You don't want to take a student that's 17 years old but actually only has ninth grade credits and put them in junior level school classes. So there are some factors. But with elementary students, Unless they have something that the CDC would consider a communicable disease that might be a, an issue, we have to get those students enrolled right away. And then the paperwork follows the child. Uh, how long does it take for the paperwork to get there? As long as it takes. If it takes two months, it takes two months. If it takes six months, it takes six months. The parent has to be making an effort to get it, or the district itself is going to s 
to uh, contact the previous school districts. A lot of times when the families have moved several times, it may take a long time to get all the records, but you have to make sure you, you get them enrolled. Free lunch. Every student's eligible for free meals for the entire school year and 30 days of the next. That's a federal uh, program. Your nutrition services department in public schools will take care of that. Even if they're not homeless or they secure housing or they won the lottery, they're still eligible for those free meals for that school year and 30 days of the next. And then finally, the big issue is transportation. If the parent requests transportation to the school of origin, we are required to provide it. Transportation doesn't necessarily mean busing. Now, OPS does, a, I think, a really good job with our, most of our homeless situations in getting buses set up. There's a time delay, and so that's a bit of a problem. Um, it may include crossing state lines, and what I mean by that, again, this is Omaha, because I, I, I speak to Omaha, but Council Bluffs has three shelters that we work with. Council Bluffs, Iowa, across the river, if you're familiar with Omaha. We have a, a traditional family homeless shelter, we have a domestic violence a shelter, and then we have a safe house. And so when those students or families move to those areas, we do have to transport them back to their school of origin. If the family chooses to enroll in a different school within your district, you're no longer required to transport them because that wouldn't be their school of origin. So they're homeless and they're going to, I'll use an example, Beals Elementary in Omaha. And they go there for a while and they decide, you know what, we want to go to Liberty instead. Well, you, we'll work with you to trans transfer schools, but we don't have to transport you at that point. So keep that in mind. Historically, once you secured permanent housing, transportation was off the table. Under ESSA, now you're eligible for school transportation for the remainder of the school year, whether you have housing or not, because it's been deemed that the mobility that's been involved and the lack of being anchored uh, plays a role. So we want to make sure that we keep taking that student to school, even if they do find permanent housing. So transportation is the big issue. Uh, in Omaha in particular, on the homeless program, just on the homeless program itself, we spend over a million dollars a year on transporting students. Now keep in mind, we'll have a thousand students in the program, which is low, but that's what our average enrollment for the program is. But we'll spend a million dollars a year. And knowing that, just to give you an example, not every school district in the state of Nebraska applies for funding to the federal government for McGinney Vento funds. There's like 12 districts that apply. OPS is one of them. We match what we receive. We receive, I think last year we received $75,000 from the federal government for McKinney Vento, and we match at $75,000 with our, with our own budget. So, million dollars for transportation, and we got $75,000 from the government, and it doesn't really add up. The state last year, I think, received $250,000, and that was dispensed to 12 districts. So, Keeping in mind that the government doesn't have to subsidize your transportation, it just has to throw you a bone and say, all right, you gotta work your magic, come up with something. So keeping in mind that transportation doesn't mean busing. Some districts have provided bicycles and bicycle helmets. We jokingly have said some of the smaller districts that funding, have give, we're gonna give skateboards. Taxi cabs or cab service is something that Millard Public Schools uses. We have used in the past, but astronomical costs and the risk reward is, is just not worth it. There were too many horror stories. We had cab drivers asking young ladies for phone numbers. We had kids taken to the wrong school, kids taken to the wrong address. Uh, and so it just wasn't one of those things that was feasible. Now we have a contract with an agency in town called NCAP, Eastern Nebraska Community Action Partnership, wonderful agency. We have some vans that we lease through them to provide transportation support to our homeless program, particularly the outlying shelters like, McKin uh, like, like in Council Bluffs. But again, it's a drop in the bucket. So it is our requirement to find ways to transport students. You just have to come up with ways. So our district does a good, good job. It's just an area that, that we fall short on. I know Lincoln uses cabs. And again, our enrollment's a little larger than some of the other districts, but of course our district's a lot larger. So let's move on a little bit. Let's talk about some of the barriers and the risk factors to education and school students schools to students experience success that are homeless or near homeless. There are several of these and I have these listed. I'm going to go through these really quickly. It's not stuff that you don't already know, but it's stuff sometimes it's good to be reminded about. Particularly again, thinking of students that are homeless or near homelessness, in poverty, lacking the income, knowing they're going to have to move at the end of the month, don't know where we're going to go, 
might end up on a shelter, might end up on a waiting list, might end up with family and move again a week later. That's not an uncommon situation. In fact, it happens all too commonly in OPS. On an average, we'll have 1,000 students enrolled in the program. Virtually 50% of those students will be in shelters and agencies during the school year, more than one. And the other 50% is generally in hotels and motels and or in doubled up situations. So keep in mind that the doubled up situation, we may have a family in that doubled up situation. They have the house, they own it, they pay for it, they rent it, and the other family is just living with them. They're homeless, the other family isn't. So they may go to the same school. We might have to bust the homeless family, but the other family wouldn't get busted. Do people have to identify themselves as homeless? Yeah. I have a tendency to jump around, so I'm going to jump around right now. Enrollment in terms into the program, how does it work? All of you are potential uh, 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 advocates or referrals for homeless students. In our district, we have social workers, counselors, teachers, secretaries. Anytime anyone identifies a student as homeless or potentially homeless, they let us know. And then we do a brief investigation. We don't do home visits very often. A lot of times social workers might. We just don't have the, the, the resources to constantly do that. But if we deem them homeless because they're not in that permanent address or, or, or particularly if they're living with another family and we contact them, you just ask some real basic questions. It's, it's one of those things that you can find out pretty quickly. You, oh, you know, definitely doubled up. If they, a lot of times we'll get families that, uh, sometimes we have situations where we'll have families, two families living in the same house and they both want to say they're homeless. Well, because they know the system and they want to get transportation. And uh, it, it's just reality. There's a manipulation there on, on part of the families. And they're like, well, we can get busing to school. Let's tell them we're homeless. Okay, well, one of you is homeless, one of you is not. And if we can't come up with a situation, then we can't help either. And it, it solves itself pretty quickly. Now, I will tell you with all the shelters and the agencies we serve, each year we have an enrollment form that we have that we give them, and they send it to us. We have a great working relationship with the shelters and the agencies in Omaha. They also have an exit or a discharge form that they send us, which has a forwarding address when the families leave. We'll have families leave shelters five different times during a school year. They'll move to five different locations in Omaha. It's not uncommon. And we scurry, we get, we get things changed. And this enrollment form that we have at the shelters and agencies serves kind of as sort of a, a kind of a, several rules. It serves as an enrollment form for the program, obviously, has the students' names, the parents' information. It serves as a release of information for OPS to talk to that family and any other shelter involved or any other agency involved. It serves as a change of address because we've got to make sure we have the correct address for the shelter unless it's a dom domestic violence situation in which we probably wouldn't change it uh, depending on the circumstances. And then uh, also serves as an, as an enrollment form for the school. So if they're at a school and, and, and it's on the form, we know that that's the school they're at. If they want to change schools, we can use that to enroll in a different school. And so that form itself is at all the shelters and agencies. It's also on our website. Families that are doubled up work with their schools, and the schools contact me directly. They also have access to this form, and they fax it or email it or whatever the case may be. So that's sort of how they're enrolled. Um, there is a, each school district has what's called a dispute resolution process. It's, a, it's a, a situation, just like it sounds. If you have a family that wants to dispute the fact that, well, we're homeless and you say we're not, there is a process that goes through your district all the way to NDE or to the state level and even to the federal government if you had to go that far. Never once in my duration have we ever had that happen. I always err on the side of caution. If that family is potentially homeless or we think they're homeless, again, thinking of the needs of the child, that's what we're focusing on. If it comes down to it that a little bit later, you know what, this family pulled the wool over her eyes or they were full of baloney or whatever the case may be, so be it. But that child's in need to begin with more than likely. Again, keeping in mind OPS is 75% free and reduced, so we're pretty high poverty anyway. And so anytime we have a student, it's actually 74.9, I like to say 75, it sounds, wow, that sounds worse than 74.9, but. Uh, and so anytime we have a situation like that, we err on the side of caution. So areas that, that we talk about are areas that I kind of want to re review with you guys. Um, student mobility, family mobility, a big issue. School-related factors, and we'll break all these down a little bit. Cultural knowledge and understanding is a big thing, particularly with OPS because of our migrant education program. And we are basically, um, we're a third Caucasian, a third uh, Hispanic or Latino, and we're a third African American. And a lot of our Latino population uh, kind of, uh, I think they fly under the radar, or they try to, because they're not sure of what's available to them. And we'll talk about that a little bit. Poverty and income, obviously an issue with homelessness or near homelessness. 
physical health, mental health, medical care, I know that that's part of the things that some of the folks that are with SKIP deal with. Food, you wouldn't think of food as being an issue, but we'll talk about that a little bit. Lack of that social support. Yeah, they might be doubled up with another family, but that doesn't mean they have a social support system. It doesn't mean they have someone they can rely on. A lot of times we'll have families that maybe live with somebody else just out of necessity. They get kicked out by that family. Perhaps they go back and live with their own parents out of necessity, and they get kicked out of that situation, and they bounce in and out of shelters. Internal family issues, uh, community issues. And then obviously there are some issues related to race or ethnicity. So school mobility. Well, students that are in homeless situations, obviously their test scores, their grades, their dropout rates, special education uh, services are all affected because you're constantly on the move. You can't settle down. You don't have the opportunity necessarily to study in the way that you'd need to study. If you're constantly moving, you may not have the ability to access even a simple library or the internet or something of that nature. Students suffer psychological damage socially and academically from this mobility. You think about a student with that self-esteem issue, the student that talks about being, I'm a hotel kid or I live in my car. If you imagine that again, going back to being a nine-year-old, the type of damage that that can take a toll on you over a given period of time, let alone one day. And you'll still have students or teachers that maybe don't necessarily acknowledge this in the way we'd like. We don't want to stigmatize those students. We don't want to segregate those students. We need to be sensitive to their issues and be aware of it. We need to address it, but we need to address it in a way that's supportive and helpful. Again, that mobility, the constant motion, the constant moving uh, affects, it, it affects uh, the studies have shown how it affects not only the dropout rate, but your test scores. There's a, a much less greater participation in school-related extracurricular activities. Even though at OPS we try to make sure that any of the students that are in the program can access any of the programs we have, and we provide transportation, whether it's in the evening or not. And then another interesting st statistic is that average test scores for non-mobile high schoolers with highly mobile peers are actually affected. So when you're in a high school and you have peers students in your class that you're familiar with or friends with, and you know that they're highly mobile, that actually can affect and has shown to affect students that are not in those situations. School-related factors. Lack of school classroom curriculum stability. Under-informed staff. That's, a, that's an issue that we, we deal with at OPS all the time. Every year I speak to the every, every uh, annual meeting, social worker, uh, uh, counselors, secretarial staff. And yet, it seems like some folks just are not necessarily always aware. Teachers in particular, teachers, I mean, good Lord, what a, what a difficult job. You know, and particularly in some of our OPS schools. Uh, trying to make sure we maintain test scores, the diversity within the classroom, just trying to get through the day, and then having to be able to identify students, perhaps, that are in homeless situations. It, maybe they don't, maybe they just can't do it. They just don't have enough in the day. And so even though the teachers may be aware of it, we also find teachers that aren't aware of the program. Once they do, they're a great resource. I find that working with a lot of our administrative staff, our secretarial staff at the schools is the key. Because as you know, they know everything. Student comes in the door, student goes out the door. They're the ones that oftentimes make a referral from a school about a student that's not in a shelter situation, rather they're in a doubled up situation. Or Mr. Bright, we have this family, I know that last Friday they probably stayed in their car, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What can we do? So we, you know, we try to intervene and, and then we and we figure it out. The transportation piece of it, um, we talked about that, lack of busing. And then the parents being unaware, underinformed of their rights. And this also rolls really into uh, and it's covered in another area. I mean, this goes to like, for example, the migrant education program or students that uh, are with Hispanic families or Latino families. There's a language barrier. There's a fear, especially now with deportation. If perhaps the parents are not, um, they don't necessarily have the necessary legal paperwork to be in the country, and so they worry about intervening. Keep in mind the McKinney-Vento program has absolutely nothing to do with any of those legalities. The only piece that McKinney-Vento would do would be if there was an abuse-neglect situation that we needed to intervene on by calling CPS. 
Homelessness is not illegal. It's not abusive necessarily. It's not deliberate. And so you have to keep in mind that although the students may be struggling, it's not necessarily something that's going to be illegal or considered to be a situation where they needed some sort of legal intervention. And so we want to make sure that we are telling parents what's available to them and, and, and why it's available to them. I work in the Title I department at OPS, and that covers oh, about a third of our schools. I work with the entire district, but a third of the schools are Title I. That has to do with funding and academic test scores, stuff like that. Um, but we really do a, a, a really good job of trying to make sure parents understand what's available to them and why it's available to them. Everybody has access to McKinney-Vento. And we have a bilingual liaison that works in our office with this pro program in particular. Our brochures are in Spanish and English. We don't have it in Korean yet. There's just too many uh, dialects to that to get that taken care of. But, and, and, and so we're always trying to make sure families understand what's available to them in terms of this program. The cultural issues, I just talked about that. There's language barriers, lack of, lack of just sort of fundamental school district knowledge, too, that everybody doesn't understand. There's that fear of repercussion I talked about. And, and there's another piece that we don't talk about too often, but it's that shame and embarrassment. I have had a lot of parents come to me just the, angry at first because they're defensive and, and, and concerned, and then they break down, and then they just tell you the truth. Or they just they let it all out and just say, you know, I'm at, I'm at my wit's end here. I've had, uh, in the, I, I, you all have worked with many, many families in, 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 in ter terrible situations, and I see it all the time with homelessness. Uh, just last week I had a mother deported, or detained for deportation, had five children, two high school, one middle school, two elementary school. So they placed the children with the 20-year-old sister so that the kids could stay for now, trying to figure out what we're going to do with the family. The two elementary kids were terrified, just terrified. I happened to go out to the school and talk to the principal, and I met with the, the two young girls, and they were just terrified. They just did not understand. And so it, it's one of those things that, well, we're not going to let that happen, so we're going to keep you at your school. We're going to make sure we get busing set up from your 20-year-old sister, who's a, virtually a kid herself, and she has these care now for these, for these five younger siblings. So those are situations that, again, that's the homeless situation you deal with. They're homeless because they, they're living with their sister, not at the place they were living when mom was detained. Children make up 24% of the U.S. population, but they represent 34% of the population living in poverty. Again, it kind of goes back to that, how many students are homeless every night, or how many children are homeless every night. And another interesting thing, and I don't like to get into, uh, you know, I don't want to get into the economics of homelessness and that type of thing, but the federal poverty level for a family of four in 2014 was basically $24,000. But it basically, the studies indicate that you need twice as much that just to basic to meet basic needs and so children living below experience this greater list, risk of homelessness i mean it's not it's not on, it's it's common sense that if you're not making enough money at the end of the month there's a risk that you're going to be in a homeless situation or possibly be evicted kicked out of your home maybe your you 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 know your home will go in foreclosure because you don't have the money and that's not that's not just somebody that's at an economic level. I mean, hell, a couple, couple lost checks on my end, and I'm going to be, be having to foreclose my house because I may not be able to make that payment, and I'd end up in that situation. Uh, an interesting situation about one of the districts in the metropolitan area, one of the smaller ones outside Omaha. Their superintendent uh, and husband were uh, building a house, and they had school-age school children that went to the particular school that they were part of. And uh, their house wasn't going to be done yet, and they had sold their other house. So they ended up still renting an apartment for like two months. They lived in, moved in with her mom. And at that point, that family, even though the superintendent of a school district, was actually homeless under McKinney-Vento. So for two months, those children could have received services. They didn't. But that kind of tells you how this law works. It doesn't discriminate based on income or job title. It really does apply to the situation for which you're living. Some of the physical and mental health issues, the uh, lack of immunizations on a lot of our, our students, especially those that move around a lot. And you wouldn't think that that's too big of a deal, but it catches up with you. So then a, a lot of those students have a tendency to be, miss more days due to illness. And I mean physical illness, not necessarily talking about mental health care. 
several studies showing that uh, those that are in homeless situations, near poverty situations, experience more behavioral issues within the school system or within the classroom on a daily basis. There's a higher proportion of disruptive behaviors. There's the social phobia, disorders, and then major depression. The longer you're homeless, and what I mean by that is the longer the student stays in homelessness or periodically goes through their academic career, say K through 12, and they're homeless on a regular basis, the higher propensity it is for major depression to set in. Because the students are already dealing with dysthymia or, or some depression to begin with. How could you not be? But if you repeatedly are in this situation and your family moves, and I've seen it, I've had students that were at third grade and then repeatedly and repeatedly and then they end up in high school. And their parents call me at some point during the school year. Now, it's not always the beginning of the school year, but it's almost like old home week. I'm a voice that they look to. You guys all know this. When you get a family that's in need and you are someone that listens to them, they'll call you constantly, constantly for something. And that's, that's great. I want that to happen. I want open dialogue with all my families that I work with. But when it's a yearly basis, and then they'll say, almost matter-of-factly, you know, Mr. Bright, I'm in a homeless situation again, or couldn't pay my rent this month, or something of that nature. As much as I want to make sure that we serve that student, it's very disappointing for me because I, I want to see the family do better. And I've had some real frank talks with some parents. I, I, I developed some, you know, some trust and some rapport, and, and, and we try to provide programming. We try to provide referrals. But it, it's not always a, a, an easy situation. And then there's a greater exposure to violence, trauma, sexual exploitation, sexual and physical violence, and sexual activity. Uh, we see this a lot. In, there's a couple particular shelters in Omaha. There's one particular shelter in Omaha that I don't always refer families to. It's a real traditional shelter, and I don't want to see moms with single children go there if we can avoid it. It's better than sleeping in your car. But, and, and in those situations, there are... are on a daily or nightly basis, there's things that just they shouldn't, children shouldn't be exposed to. It just happens. And, and no matter how many rules you have in place at some of these facilities, it just happens. And so they see things and they experience things. Obviously, those students that come from domestic violence situations where their family or their parent is in a domestic violence situation, they're going to experience things, and that's going to carry over. The food piece. The food piece that you don't think about necessarily when you think about homelessness and food, you think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, food, clothing, and shelter. Well, one of the things that we want to make sure that we have our students in school on a daily basis that are in homeless situations is because we want to make sure they're getting two square meals a day. They're going to have breakfast. They're going to have lunch. And then we also have a backpack program where we'll send food home on weekends with students on Fridays. But if you think about it, approximately 60% of children, young adults, adults report inadequate food consumption in terms of quantity, and this is a homeless statistic. So they're not necessarily getting enough to eat. 40% report fasting for an entire day, or not being able to afford food during the past month. And this, even in our shelters, we have, you know, they serve meals, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're getting all the food they need. Or if they're not in a program, they're not in, in one of our shelters, and they're living in their car, they're not going to have enough food. I mean, imagine being a student that goes to school hungry. Not only did you not necessarily get dinner last night, but you don't know when you leave school today if I'm going to the same place I was last night. I don't know if I'm going to sleep in the same bed tonight. I don't even know who's going to pick me up if I'm not on one of the buses that OPS has. When I go back to the bus stop, is my mom or dad going to be there to get me? Un not an uncommon situation where I'll get a call at 5 o'clock. Mr. Bright, you know, this is such and such from our dispatch, buses at the bus stop for the Jones family, parents know where to be found, what should we do? Well, under the district policy, we're bus is supposed to go back to the school, take those kids back, call CPS. We try to avoid that. You try to find out, well, give it some time, let's figure this out, wait a minute, let's see what happens, and if the parent shows up. Now, that's happened this year, I don't know how many times, countless times. We don't want to go down that route, but when the parent's not there, what else can we do? It goes right back to that student mental health piece. That student's already not feeling very good. There's an in inadequacy in internally. Parents not there when they get off the bus. That child's terrified. I, I don't know where I'm going to be tonight. So food becomes almost less of a priority. So if you're not able to eat, I mean, studies, you all know the studies. You've got to have you know, uh, uh, meals in order to function as, uh, academically. In order to study, you have to have the nutrition you need, which goes to that last piece. 
inadequate intakes of nutrition, iron, magnesium, zinc, and other vitamins. A lot of, a lot of students don't have that early on. And I know this seems like it's like over the top or graphic, but there's more truth than fiction in this. Even though we only have 803 students in the program, I would speculate that a lot of those students don't have adequate meals on a daily basis, other than when they're in school. The support systems. Weak and unstable support systems. A lot of times our family's on the move. They don't really connect with other people. Yeah, they have they, people they meet in the shelter, or yes, they're living with somebody if they're in a doubled up situation. But that doesn't mean they have the support system that you and I had. They may not have the relationship with their parents. Some of us have great relationships with our moms and our dads or our siblings or our friends. They don't necessarily have those types of relationships that make a difference on a daily basis. They have fewer so social support networks. Um, although they may have larger social networks, they don't necessarily perceive these networks as positive and they don't necessarily have those strong relationships. And then going to that unaccompanied youth, that couch surfer, they oftentimes experience more family problems, so they relate more to their friends. Oftentimes they end up in a male-female relationship. Young girls end up moving in with their boyfriend and their boyfriend's parents. I, I have that happen quite a bit. Uh, boyfriends may end up moving with their girlfriend. And then that leads to the sexual activity um, and other issues that as a result of the homelessness uh, can come into play for those students. And so you have to be aware of those situations and make sure that those happen or, or that they don't happen and that we're trying to intervene in those situations as well. The troubles in families. Parents lack education a lot of times in these situations. Not always, but a good majority of the parents don't necessarily have the academic skills or the acumen to uh, deal with family situations. Their income is low. There's a divorce rate that's fairly high or a separation rate, not necessarily a divorce rate. Uh, there's the domestic violence piece. And uh, the domestic violence piece is, is, is uh, it's much more prevalent than people think. And when we talk about domestic violence in McKinney-Vento, we're not talking about immediate. We're talking about a history of. We'll find out that a, a mom that's in a shelter maybe have been in several domestic violence situations previously, currently not. And so that the trauma associated with that does affect them over a long-term basis. And then that affects that long-term risk of homelessness. It's sort of that, I don't want to say apple from the tree situation, but once you get in that cycle of poverty and homelessness, it's really difficult to break it. Very difficult without some sort of support system. And when you don't necessarily have a family support, or you don't have the social circles, and you don't have the academic skills or the, or the, the economic acumen to understand how to manage my money, We'll have families that'll be in a shelter for six months, they'll be in a program that the shelter has, they'll find employment, they'll have enough money, they'll say they're moving out, we'll get everything changed within, before the end of the school year, they aren't able to pay the rent at the end of the month and they end up back in a homeless situation because they just don't have the necessary skills as adults to continue in that positive manner. Uh, the community issues, well, we have underfunded schools, and I, I mean, and public schools in general are, are generally underfunded. And that's not, doesn't seem like it's gonna get any better over the next four years. Uh, there's a lot of community violence that students, uh, that students will experience, especially those unaccompanied youth. Uh, if they don't experience it firsthand, they see it. They see it on the news, they see it in, in, the, in the, the paper, or they'll see it within, within their own school system, and they'll be aware of it. It does affect children. Again, when a child doesn't have a real stable self-esteem, when they don't go home to an environment every night that's a stable home, and then there's these things circling around them like uh, violence in the community, that has a propensity to affect that child a little deeper and create a little bit more fear because it's just that much closer to who they are as opposed to someone living in that traditional home with a mom and dad that seems like a pretty safe environment. And they don't have the parents intervening and telling them, you know, to not to worry about that, that that's not going to affect us, that we're okay. Because honestly, a lot of those situations, those kids know they're not okay. I don't know where we're going to be tomorrow. Or we're going to be here 30 days. We were at the last shelter for 30 days, and then we left. We, didn't, we, we ran out of time, and they asked us to leave, that type of thing. Uh, and then the lack of extracurricular activities. Um, there, there is some so social 
isolation for families that are homeless. Again, might be around a lot of other people, but even a lot of our shelters, they have rooms in one room and the family will go to the room together and they spend a lot of time in that room alone. And then finally, uh, there, you know, th there isn't racial or ethnic issues. I mean, the statistics are out there. More than 60% of the children in the United States under the age of 11 who live in low-income homes are African-American, Indian, or Hispanic. It's just statistics. Ethnicity does play a significant role in a child's cultural identity. Uh, and you can see that as a child ages, uh, particularly students that may gravitate towards gang affiliation. Uh, and they may identify with a culture because maybe their home life wasn't that good or they did leave home or they were an unaccompanied youth and they are bouncing around. And so that does have a tendency to affect them. And again, it all starts with that homelessness or that near homelessness. Let's talk a little bit about uh, homeless education liaisons. For example, myself. Every district that's a public school should have someone designated to do this. It doesn't have to be a full-time employee. In my case, it's a full-time job and then some. But uh, Eva, for example, Lincoln Public Schools right there. She's your homeless education coordinator, liaison. You don't have to necessarily have a person, but you do have to have someone within your district. Smaller districts oftentimes will refer to the superintendent. They may only have a handful of homeless students. Uh, this person can have other duties within the district or the building. We'd like to see that you have a bilingual designation or a person that's bilingual because of the obvious reasons. You want to make sure that McKinney-Vento students are identified. That's their job. They want to make sure that they're served. They want to make sure that they're informing the students, the parents, and other staff of the rights of McKinney-Vento. Again, that's what the liaison's supposed to do. We talked about that dispute resolution process that does come across my desk. I've never had one. Want to make sure that we're working with appropriate agencies to provide uh, the, the services to the children. And that we also work with the state coordinator. The Department of Education has a homeless education coordinator, and she oversees those districts that have um, services in, in, the, uh, in the state of Nebraska. And finally, kind of boils down to us, staff-wise, you folks, myself. What, what can we do? What, what can we do? What role can we play? Not necessarily just educational personnel, but all of us. Well, we obviously, and I know a lot of you focus on making sure that students' needs are met and or that they're staying in school, whether they're mental health needs, whether they're you know, family needs, and so we're all doing the right thing. But a lot of times, we, we may forget that the family is in a homeless situation or near homelessness, and so we want to make sure that we're identifying that. We want to make sure that we're doing this in a timely manner, and we want to make sure we're providing the appropriate educational services. One of the things that I need to make sure that happens is that the student gets the appropriate education. Nah, they're not just in school, but are we meeting their needs? Well, this student has an IEP, and maybe the IEP's three years outdated. Well, we need to get this thing updated. We need to make sure that those needs are being met. Being a safe person, being someone they can talk to, making sure that our school district is aware and is a safe place, and again, falls upon my shoulders, Eva's shoulders, whomever in your school district that's supposed to do that. Being a resource for your, your school districts. I know some of you work with particular schools. Well, in those schools, they're all public schools is my understanding. So they should have someone who's designated within that district or that school to serve students that are homeless. If they don't, you should ask, who's your person here that serves homelessness? And if they say, well, we don't really deal with that. Well, you're wrong, because some, somebody in your school does, and you do have homeless students in your, children, students in your district. One of the things I noticed about Omaha when I was first taking over the job, I worked with Millard, I worked with Bellevue, I worked with Ralston, I worked with Gretna, I worked with some of the other school districts, West Side, and a lot of them, well, you don't have homeless students. Yeah, you do. No, 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 that's your, that's your responsibility. We, you know, that student uh, uh, goes to Gretna, but they live out in one of the shelters in Omaha, that's your responsibility. No, that's not how it works. It's the district's responsibility where that child's attending. And everybody has homeless students. Homelessness, again, going back to it's not I will work for food type of sign. It can be any student. The average homeless person in the United States is a nine-year-old. So yeah, your district does have homeless students. So be aware of it. Be vigilant in trying to figure it out. Um, I will pass to the end here. My contact information, I have those brochures in the back. But I do want to ask, I know I threw a lot at you, I kind of talked fast, I told you it was kind of, uh, you know, it's general information, but it's broad. Does anybody have any particular questions? Any experience that they may have had that they dealt with when they realized they did have a student that was in a homeless situation? Yes, ma'am. Good question. 
the question was in terms of acknowledging in the school, if a school counselor is aware that they have a student at home, should we let the teacher know? Yeah, I think it's important to do that. Now there is some sensitivity, like in our district, not everybody is aware of it, nor does everybody have access to the information in our data system. I don't like to use the term as needed or on an as needed basis, because when the referrals come from a school, a lot of times the school is aware of it. But uh, we need to make sure that the, when I have a family, I make sure that the school counselor is aware or, or a particular teacher is aware of it uh, because it may have a bearing on how the student acts in the classroom, um, you know, behaviorally or, or academically. And, and so we don't want to say, well, there's something wrong with uh, Johnny because he looks tired and it, well, you know, we also don't want, well, Johnny's homeless, that's why. No, we don't want to go that route either. So that actually happened in our student placement office uh, during the holiday break. Um, homelessness doesn't take, homelessness doesn't follow the school calendar. I'm a 12 month employee for obvious reasons. Just because there's a spring break doesn't mean that, oh, no homelessness, spring break. That's summer, no homelessness. No, it happens constantly. Families are always constantly moving. So we're dealing with more than just the school piece of it because we do f provide a lot of referral information. We work with Family Housing Advisory Services and a lot of agencies in Omaha to make sure that we have housing in place or try to you know, provide funding somehow to help the families. We don't provide direct funding through the program, but there are obviously a lot of programs that can provide funding for families. So we, uh, we try to make sure that that goes on. But we had a situation real quickly uh, during the holiday break where one of our staff down in our student placement office, uh, they had called me down and said, hey, we have a family down here. Can you come down and meet with them? They were at, at a shelter and they'd come up to register their ch children. It was um, right, right after Christmas, was, I don't know, December 27th, or I don't know what the day was. But uh, so I walk in and the family wasn't right there in the office and, and the particular person that had called me was talking to somebody else across the room and she literally yelled, no, no, it's the homeless family. Where are they at? That's who Mr. Bright needs to meet with. And there were other people there. And I later kind of it just addressed the issue and said, let's, let's try to find a better way of making reference to this. We don't want to announce it because it's, it's, it, there is a sensitivity to it. Um, there is a confidentiality piece to it, and, and you do certainly have a right to keep that confidential. So, um, any other questions? Okay, well, again, if uh, my, my information's on the back, there's flyers back there. Uh, if you ever have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me. I appreciate your time. Thank you, thank you, thank you.